What's up, everybody? This is Shannon Clancy, Program Director for the Junior Wizards, and welcome to the very first episode of the Monumental Coaches Academy. So when we set out to create our youth basketball platform here at Monumental Sports, uh, there were three main areas of focus that we wanted to concentrate on. Camps and clinics, tournaments and showcases, and coaches education. Uh, we have such a unique arrangement here at Monumental with three uh, separate professional basketball teams that we would be remiss if we didn't tap into that resource uh, and give back to the coaching community, both here in the DMV and, and beyond. So that's where the Monumental Coaches Academy comes in. Uh, now, we obviously would prefer to be doing this in person, uh, and we will, again, someday. Uh, but for now, this is what we got, so let's make the best of it. So each episode will be split into two parts. The first part it was going to focus more on our guest's coaching journey. Uh, how they got to where they are, uh, what the work that they put in to get them, uh, some mentors along the way that help them out. Uh, and the second half, we'll focus more on our X's and O's. Uh, what's their favorite blob and slob, uh, beating a 2-3 zone, or defense, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, so let's bring in our first guest. Uh, he's the head coach of the Capital City Go-Go, uh, Coach Ryan Richmond. Coach, thanks for having uh, taking some time out and talking to us today. Great to be here, Shannon. Hope you're doing well. I like the defender you have over there. Perfect for our uh, subject today. So I, I want to start by talking about your background. Uh, you were a D3 player at Skidmore. And then from there, you transferred to Maryland, where you were a practice player with the women's team. Uh, talk to us about that, that transfer, how that came about, how you went from, from playing at Skidmore and jumping over to University of Maryland. Yeah, so uh, I was playing Division three basketball for a year, and really in my life, I wasn't in the maturation stage to really handle kind of where I was on the team, and, and I wasn't ready to just commit to, to working hard for my minutes and really just, you know, coming from high school and being one of the starters and a, a star player it was hard for me to adjust. And I really just, I left Skidmore and I didn't really know what it was gonna entail. And, and it, for me, it's kind of a motivator because I really left and, and kind of put basketball on the back burner, wanted to go to a bigger state school just to experience a big state school feel. So a lot of uh, my journey was, was really sparked because I had, um, I would say I had a, like an early failure, I would say. So I went to Maryland and I had known that I wanted to be involved with basketball. I just didn't know what capacity and where it would lead. I had a friend at the University of Wisconsin that was a practice player for the women's team. So at first I tried to walk on the men's team. They never had tryouts. So instead I did what my friend at Wisconsin did and I was a practice player for the women's team. And that's kind of where my journey began in the coaching world. And it was, uh, I had no idea it would lead me to this, but it's, uh, it's quite the lesson just in terms of just not knowing where your steps are going to be. But if you just keep pursuing your passion, good things will happen. And how, how do you think being a practice player helped you as a coach? I would say just being a practice player was – my first introduction to high level coaching because we as a practice team were we were being coached we were thrown into practice drills like we were being held accountable the same way the players were and it really was an incredible experience to excuse me to join with the players and you really felt like you were a part of the team and i think that just like being able to handle coaching being able to be held accountable even as a practice player is something that I take with me on a daily basis. Cool. So transitioning a little further, you go, you're a, uh, a grad assistant at Maryland, and then you make the jump into the NBA as a, as a video assistant, video coordinator, which there's been a, a few coaches recently who, who've made that jump that we all know about. Coach Spo down in Miami uh, was Vogel one also. I think he, people were talking about him as well. So what, what was that transition like? What was that transition going from college and then going into the video room here, uh, here with the Wizards? 
Yeah, I had, a, I had an amazing experience as a grad assistant on the men's side with Coach Turgeon in his first two years um, at Maryland. Just being able to see a program, you know, be, uh, I would say, reinvigorated, but also like going through those tough times of starting a new foundation because obviously he was replacing Gary Williams, a legend, and to replace him was hard. And now, now you see their success, but it, it took time. And obviously our first couple of years were tough. Um, we had to really set a standard. I, I learned a lot about just kind of setting a new foundation and, and sticking to to that and, and kind of going through some of those tough times. But going from college to the pros was a transition I knew I always wanted to make. It was something that for me was always a goal was to be in the NBA. I grew up in Connecticut and UConn men's basketball in Connecticut is just incredible especially then I mean I was all of us were just fanatics we followed I followed all of the NBA players from Ben Gordon to Richard Hamilton Ray Allen and Mecca Okafor you know you could go go down the list but in Connecticut you get the Knicks Nets and Celtics games every single night so I'm watching NBA games and following the UConn players and that's where my passion really really flourished for the NBA. So I always knew I wanted to be in the NBA and, and moving from college to the NBA was an incredible change for me because a lot of the things that you forget about um, that you're able to move on past, like college was amazing, but there was a lot of things like school and um, recruiting, a lot of things that don't really have to do with basketball. And I really wanted to be in a situation like the NBA that was just, you're getting, I tell people all the time, you get your PhD in basketball and I'm still learning, but you get your PhD in your first few years in the video room. Cool. So what is, what's the best piece of advice someone gave you along the way uh, as you're starting your coaching journey? So David Atkins, who's our player development director for the Wizards, assistant coach now, we work together. He was actually my coach of the scout team. Like he was an assistant coach with the Maryland women's team, but uh he told me when I got the GA job to get water, get coffee. And there was a expletive on the finish of that, but something with the, the we won't, with, with we the, won't go into what it was, the but that's general right. <laughs> idea of just kind of keep your mouth closed and, and, and not in a negative way, but more so just keep your head down, do whatever it takes. Like, and, and I think the first cup, get water and get coffee, you know, like if the players need water, if the, if the coaches need coffee, go get it. And then keep your head down. Don't necessarily talk a ton and just, just learn, listen, and just keep working. And I think that that's kind of the best advice I, I could have gotten at that point in my life. And really, I think about it to this day, because you're really looking for, you know, those type of people to be around you who are li lifelong learners and who really want to just put their head down and work. That's great. Uh, yeah. I, I one thing I always saw with coaching is you have to kind of toe the line between confidence and staying incredibly humble. I think that exactly what you said there, staying, getting the coffee, just being soaking everything in, being a sponge uh, is a great lesson for our, for our coaches watching. Shannon, I would just add that it, I think all those, those things just help gain trust. And once you can gain trust of the, the, your colleagues and your peers, I think it's just, it's easy to, from there, that's where, that's where you can kind of make your imprint. And that's where some coaches that trust you might say, Hey, what do you think about this scout? What, what did you think about this action? You know, how, how did Denver guard that screening action? How can we guard it? And I think just be, beginning to find your voice starts with gaining trust of the people around you. Totally. Um, so if you're a young coach, just looking to get into, into the game right now, what's the number one piece of advice you would give them? I would say to not look around and see where other people are and just kind of stay on your journey. I think with everything that we have right now with social media and um, all, all of those tools that we have that allows us to look at other people's lives and naturally we'll compare ourselves to other people's lives. I think that can be really dangerous. So I think it's just important to stay on your path, like love what you do, study what you do, but also don't look around and compare yourself, right? This, it, it's like, it's one, we all have our own journeys and just the more we, we stick to our own journeys and our own paths, the better we'll be. Cool. 
And I think what comes with that too, I'll add is just patience. It's just not, not trying to get everything so fast. Like it takes time. And sometimes it's, it's hard to just sit back, be patient and learn. But I think that because you want to be ready for your opportunity. So I think if you could sit back, be patient and learn, you'll be ready when the opportunity comes because the opportunity will come. And it's just up to all of us just to step into that opportunity and make the most of it. Great. Um, so what have you got for us today? What do you want to talk about? So I wanted to talk about defense. I pulled five clips from the bubble of opposing teams that I wanted to show you all because I do think that it is important. Defense is so critical right now in the NBA and really in college and, and in high school. And I was talking to a college coach the other day who, who was talking about the challenge of his players, getting his players to understand how critical defense is. So I just wanted to uh, go here and so you can see my screen. I will make it full screen. And I think this clip just shows Toronto has been one of the best defensive teams in the league. And if you see, they're really scrambling around. Like it's not perfect, but just the scramble to contest a shot Butler because... is great. And I think that a lot of times we teach defense and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, technical things you want to, to really kind of hammer home. But a lot of times it's, it's really about energy and effort and really your commitment to one another. So that clip to me just shows that. I think also great defense starts with pressure on the basketball and containing the basketball. So if you look here, first of all, if you freeze it, you know, they're all really in a stance. They're showing their hands. Um, the court is, is shrunk, like we like to say. So the paint is protected. And obviously Adebayo does a really good job of guarding one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that the more that players, coaches, we can enforce and really teach how to defend one-on-one, -on -one, it's important. And, and just remember, as you see in this clip, is that it, yes, it's about the, guy, the, the player on the ball, but it's also about the players off the ball and how they show their presentation. We call it a presentation. If you show your hands and you're in a stance, that's going to help so much defensively. And it's simple because it, it's very controllable. Very similar here, right? So if you look at this clip and you just look at Crowder here in the corner and you see his hands, you see Jimmy Butler here, you know, a lot of times one-on-one -on -one defense, like, like we just talked about, has less to do with the person on the ball and almost more to do with the, the people surrounding him, right? Or her. And if you see here, Duncan Robinson, obviously, you know, he's a shooter. Defense isn't necessarily his strong suit. He's gotten better at it, but they're talking to him. And if I turn the volume on, you could hear the talking, the communication level, and you can even see their mouths moving, right? And they're helping Duncan Robinson feel comfortable guarding the ball with their hands and with their mouth, with their communication. And then it's a goaltending, but obviously you see the, the anticipation, right? They're all kind of on a string. As Adebayo goes, Drogic goes for the box out. And they're really all on the same page of goaltending there. Yeah, I think one of the the best lessons that we can teach players, specifically on defense, is you're not guarding your man. You're guarding the ball. That's your man. You're responsible for him, or if it's a zone, it's your area. But everything is relationship what, to what the person with the ball is doing. So it doesn't matter. If the person's all the way in the corner and you're glued to them, you're not helping anybody. You're just stuck there, okay? And – getting young players to understand this is, is key to their development uh, as a defender. Agreed. And I, I heard an, I heard an amazing line this, uh, this summer and I, I cannot pinpoint who said it. So I'm sorry uh, about the lack of annotation on this. However, well, 
the line is, is that as a team defense, you guard the ball collectively, but you can test individually. So like to your point that you just said, coach, like you guard the ball as a whole unit. All five players are in charge of guarding the ball, right? But when the shot goes up and we talk about contest a lot, you can test to the shooter's shooting hand as much as we can. And it's a high hand contest and contest force misses. So you guard the ball collectively as a unit, but when the shot goes up, it's your job individually to contest. And I think that paints a good picture. Similar idea here. And if you just freeze it right here and a lot of it's controllable, it's, it's there in a stance. They're in a stance. They're all with their hands out. Their knees are bent, their butts down. Like they're active, they're ready. And so much of defense is just your preparation. I yeah, just, sorry. just no, just just getting just getting your players to understand that when you your guy your your player doesn't have the the ball in their hands, like you're not done. <laughs> you're still until until we have the ball, you're you're where you're all part of this. It's five on one. You're guarding. And I think this, you know, Toronto has been such a great scramble team the past two years, and they've done such a great job. Um, but if you look here, right. Gasol gets switched on to Crowder, and then Van Vliet drops in the paint. And, and Gasol looks like he drops in the paint by accident, right? He doesn't – probably leaves a shooter when he shouldn't. Um, and, you know, I think part of a great defense is having each other's backs, right, as a team. And if you look at Van Vliet here, I mean, Gasol drops – it's not perfect, but Van Vliet flies out to contest, right? He's covering up a teammate's mistake purely with effort. There's nothing really else there is there, but he has effort. And, and I think sometimes it's, it's easy to think, well, that's not my man. That's not my player that I'm guarding. So it's not really my problem, but it's like, yeah, it's all of our problem. We're trying to, as Scotty, Scotty Brooks says a great thing. Like we're always trying to solve a problem on defense, right? It's like, What's the problem? We're all five collectively trying to solve it. If someone makes a mistake, it's our job to have their back. We don't just stop. Okay. So to that point, Van Vliet flies out to contest. Now, does it, does it really matter at that point if he contests? Probably not, right? They're up 15 points. It's the third quarter, but it's really about an identity. It's about not letting anyone get open shots on your defense. And I think it creates a mentality um, for, for the team moving forward. And then the last, the last one here is just, I really wanted to put this in because I think it's important, right? So they're on a fast break and Kendrick Nunn, he makes a read here. He passes it to hero, right? And he might be able to pass it to Butler, but he doesn't. So he gets blocked. Now, Jimmy Butler, Obviously, he really broke out in these finals, this playoffs. Like, he, he's, you know, solidified himself as a real superstar. And I think the superstar effort here is something we need to show for our coaches and players. He taps the ball back in transition, a tap steal, we like to call it. And then what happens, uh, I love it, is that he gets rewarded. But let's run it back because – at this point, you know, it's easy for him to put his head down and say, well, you know, I should have gotten the ball. I'm not going to give as much effort because I should have gotten the ball. Right? Yeah, you don't, you don't see him throwing his hands up or, or, you know, being demonstrative that he didn't. He's, he's, just, he's just going. He's, he's on, next play. Yeah, he's on, exactly. He's on to the next play. And he runs and he gets a steal. And then when you give great effort, you get rewarded. When you play hard, when you play with toughness, you get rewarded. And I think that that's, that clip really and, – and coming from a superstar player really sets the tone. Yeah, and how much, how much does that feed into everyone else? Like the, uh, when the star player, your best player on your team, is giving that kind of effort on every play, even on a play when he probably should have gotten the ball and didn't, he doesn't 
put his head down or anything. He he just goes next play and gives the ultimate effort, gets that back tip and, and gets the ball back for his team. How much does that then feed to the rest of the team, the the more role player types who see their their star, their leader do that? Definitely. I mean, that makes all the difference. And I think that's why they're, as a team, they were successful this past year and they, they did a great job. Um, but yeah, to your point, that, that makes all the difference and, and really escalates the level of everyone's intensity uh, moving forward in, in that game, but also like moving forward in the season. It, it just sets a tone. Cool. Um, how much, what percentage of, of your practice plan should be devoted to defense? Uh, both on a on a day by day basis and as you go through the season, I think there there needs to be whatever you want to emphasize. You need to do on a daily basis, right? So, if it's transition offense, if it's playing fast, if it's if it's if it's whatever it is, if it's rebounding, if it's free throws, whatever you really want to emphasize as a coach, I found that that it's something that needs to be touched on every day, either in a team setting like a practice or even in a pre-practice or post-practice individual workout you know a lot of things that we've done over the past few years has been increasing our individual player development defense and how we can do defense and i think that there's multiple ways you can do it um getting defense in before you get shots up or any sort of um, just kind of just kind of technique things, uh, I think helps. So I, I think it depends on what you want to emphasize to answer your question. But the second part of it is, if it is defense, I think you need to do it every day, and you need to do individual and team-based defense every day. And for our for our coaches who uh, watching who are mainly zone coaches. How- how important – I see the smirk on your face already. How important would it be to still not just focus on that and still always institute those man-to-man principles in practice on a daily basis? Yeah, I smirk because I think zone is uh, – I love zone. I mean, I think it's a great, a, great, um, a great counter. Or if it's your base defense, then I think it's, it's really important to work on it daily. But I do think that really zone has so many man – Tend to, like there's so many man-to-man principles in zone, right? It's just it's just guarding your particular area. So I think that you know a lot of the man-to-man principles and techniques we work on apply to zone. So I do think you need to work on it. But also, again, defense comes down to effort, energy, and a collective team spirit. So regardless if you're playing man or zone, you need to just that needs to be enforced on a daily basis and it needs to be like positively reinforced, right? Like, like this is what we believe in as a defense, whether it be man or zone. And, and this is how we positively reinforce it. Yeah. I, my, my high school coach always, always used to say, you know, show me a, a zone defense that doesn't have man to man principles and I'll, I'll show you a bad zone defense. So to your point, it's all it, it's all interconnected, and especially at this the young level that that we deal with uh, on junior wizard side, those those players need to know their man to man principles because if you can't if you can't guard man, you can't really guard zone either. So, cool. All right, coach. Well, this has been great. Uh, I really appreciate you taking some time to to talk to our coaches out there and, and help us out. And uh, yeah, really, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Shannon. It's been great uh, being here, and I love what what you do for for Monumental. And thank you for everything. Appreciate it. All right, that's it, everybody. We'll uh, we'll see you next time.